Okay. It's, exactly. it's precisely 3 p.m. in Brussels. And so I think we'll get started. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm Rebecca Hubbard, the Program Director with Outreach. And I'm here today with Dr. Rashid Sumala. We are hosting a webinar uh, to mark the, the publication of a working paper by Dr. Rashid Sumala on ending overfishing can mitigate impacts of climate change. Uh, and just as a bit of context, um, Our Fish is a, a campaign that works to, to support sustainable fisheries in the EU. And it has been very clear to us for some time that, of course, uh, climate is also impacting on, on fisheries, uh, not just the impact of, of the fishing and the extraction of fish, but what uh, hasn't been clear through a lot of the, the research and papers that we've seen is what would be the impact of stopping overfishing on, on those fish stocks ability to deal with climate change. So we were quite interested to see a turnaround of, of this perspective of the, the connection and the relationship between climate change and fish stocks or, and sustainable fisheries management. So this is one of the, one of the reasons that we, we commissioned Dr. Smala and Travis Dye to, to draft a working paper uh, looking at these links. And I think uh, one of the most important reasons or a couple of the, the, the reasons we've really done this at this time is that uh, the EU has committed to ending overfishing by 2020 with the reformed common fisheries policy, which is a big uh, goal and it's coming up very, very quickly. And not only that, but we have at the same time um, seen obviously increasing um, not just activism but ambition, both activism on the from the general public and ambition from from the EU and from a number of member states to really address this crisis and the emergency that is rapidly accelerating climate change and its impacts on our environment and the planet. And so, in light of the fact that we have this increasing ambition to address climate change and its impacts in light of the fact that we have this very um, very imminent deadline for ending overfishing and we also of course have in a few weeks time coming the publication of a the first and a special report from the uh, IPCC on the connection between climate change, oceans and the cryosphere, we, we thought now was a really good and, and, and pertinent time to start this conversation about what is the relationship between overfishing, biodiversity and, and marine health and climate change and, and mitigation of impacts of climate change. So that's how we got here today. And uh, Dr. Samal is going to Give a presentation on on the paper, the working paper. You can see the working paper in the go to webinar. There's a section called handouts, and so there's a copy of the paper in in there. It's also available on the Our Fish website, which is ourfish.eu. And Dr. Samala will will talk through some of the the issues that have come up through the the publication of the working paper, and then we'll open up for a discussion and questions and answers. Um, if and we're very much kind of seeing this as a as a conversation and interested in people's feedback and suggestions because then the paper will be refined and um and peer reviewed and published uh in a journal so for those of you who don't know uh dr Samali, he's a very very <laughs> accomplished fishery scientist and has worked all over the world um particularly with fisheries economics, but also with fisheries science, and also uh, just recently, uh, also a co-author of the um, IPSO report on the state of the, the ocean, state of the sea. So uh, plenty of uh, background reading for you to do after this webinar. Um, so I'll just hand over now to Dr. Samala and he can take the floor and then we'll take questions at the end. Or you can write the questions as we go if you like, mm -hmm. and we'll, we'll answer them at the end. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Rebecca. And thank you all for making time to join the webinar. Uh, I know everybody has a lot to do. 
and you took time to, to join this, so uh, much appreciated. So like Rebecca said, this is work, ongoing work. Uh, so in a way, this is like a scientific listening webinar, if you like it. So we've done some work. Before we finalize and get it published, we thought it to be good to share with interested, uh, interested colleagues like you. So that's why we are here. Uh, the title of the, of the presentation is Ending Overfishing and Mitigate Impacts of Climate Change. Now, this is, uh, this is an area, this connection is beginning to be made in the literature. There are a few papers and uh, some of them are outside by the time I finish. Uh, our hope here is to lift what has been done so far and make some new connections and, and do a paper that, that talks to not only scientists, but policy makers, uh, st uh, stakeholders of different types. So that is the aim of this work. So hopefully by the time we publish this, it's a readable, nice, brief, short, and to the point that really brings out this link between overfishing and resilience of the fish stocks and the ecosystem to climate change impacts. I have uh, this outline I've developed for you. That is, I'll start off by defining what we mean by overfishing uh, in a broad sense, actually. And then I follow this up with a quick, quick summary of climate change impacts on the ocean and the, and the living resources in the ocean. And then I go ahead to make a connection between overfishing and climate uh, resilience or resilience to climate change. And then the big issue is if we have overfishing happening and we know for various reasons it's not a good thing, how do we do our best and, and try to end this overfishing? So I have a few points. This is an area that has been discussed and debated for years. So what I'm going to do is just to give some key points and kind of bring out some, some links again uh, about how to end overfishing. Uh, and then I conclude. Now, to, to really get a broad definition, we decided to look at the concept of fishing down marine food web, uh, which is quite a nice, neat concept that brings a lot of things together. If you look at this picture, we have time on the x-axis, and then you have the state of the ecosystem and the fish stocks on the y-axis, and the number of things that are, that are depicted in this uh, simple, nice picture. You can see as time goes on, we are taking a lot of the big fish, what is called the high trophic uh, species, we're taking more valuable fish, and we're taking a lot of fish as time goes on. And as we do that, the number of fish go down, but not only that, the sizes of the fish also goes down because we keep fishing down the marine food web. That is the, the idea here. Now, apart from the population being depleted and we have the, 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 the food web also being truncated, you can see that big fish are increasingly gone in the system. So we are disturbing the food web, which is an issue, right? Because the food web is the whole structure of the system and the animals depend on each other. Some eat is a predator prey and all sorts of things going on there. And all of this together make the ecosystem work. And we are disturbing that. In addition, if you look at the bottom on the X axis, the habitat is also being, 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 being taken down. In the beginning, you see a richer habitat. And as time goes on, either because of bottom trolling and all the stuff we are doing, we are taking down the, 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 the habitats and the sea mounts and the corals and all that we're disturbing them. So this is a concept of overfishing that underlines this work. Now, next point is climate change. As, you can, as we all know, sea surface temperature is rising, uh, you can see the more reddish yellowish it is, the, the, more, the, the more the average of, the long-term average of sea surface temperature is increasing. You can see that it's getting yellowish and reddish as time goes on. And, and then you have less sea ice, you have more acidification, you have less oxygen. All of this are happening in the ocean at the same time. And you can imagine 
in the biophysics of the ocean, physical system is changing. There is no question that the, the life in the ocean will also be affected. And that is the connection right there for you. Now, what this means is that if you look at this on, on my left hand side, you will see some of the key climate changes, you know, taking place there. Temperature, salinity, hypoxia, and acidification taking place, and they feed into the, the ecosystem, and, and, and it, it, it can affect organisms, as organism changes in body size and so on. Then it goes into the population of the fish and has impact. Community and the whole ecosystem are impacted, and that ultimately affects the fisheries, the, the fish we catch and use, and it, it impacts all the economics. So that looks like a one directional kind of flow. But actually, if you think, you will see that the more fishing we do, the more this will also be affected that way. So it's not a one directional thing. The focus here is climate change, but, but fishing also can lead to this kind of uh, impact. Now, we know that uh, the declining ocean has uh, serious human consequences, and this has been debated and discussed in the literature a lot. On my right hand side, on my left hand side, you see a summary of what is happening to fish stocks in the ocean. This comes from our group uh, at UBC and also from the FAO. And in both, both cases, you will see that the direction is clear. More and more we are taking fish that are, that are under pressure. And, and more and more we are taking fish on stocks that are really overexploited and, and in some cases even crashed. So, and that is the picture that, and once that, as that is happening, there are consequences on people and fisheries. The first guy that's saying, is that all the shrimp I get after all this work? So you go out and you have to fish for many hours to catch what you used to catch very quickly and easy because the ocean is depleted of fish. And this has human consequences. The lady down there is an example of what we are seeing more and more environmental refugees, right? When you have your fish is gone, climate change is coming, sea level rise, you have no food and nothing to do. Usually people don't just sit down and die. That's why we are people, they try to move. And that's why we have more and more what we call environmental refugees and forced migration. So again, these are issues we've debated a lot, but what we, haven't done much of is to say, as these fish are finishing, as people are under pressure, that also goes to affect the ecosystem. And that can lead to activities that can actually fuel more CO2 emission and, and aggravate the problems of the, of the ocean. So you have this back and forth between the two. Now, what is the connection now between overfishing and, and uh, climate change and, and resilience of the stock. So here, as you saw in the fishing down marine food web picture, one of the first things is we're taking too much fish. And so we are leaving less fish in the ocean. The populations are truncated. So the marine ecosystem is less and less complete. And we are also taking down the habitat. All of this together or separately actually weaken the health of the ocean and the fish biomass. And as, uh, as, as, as you can all relate to, if you have a system that is already on its needs and then there is another pressure hitting it, uh, stressor like climate change or ocean acidification, that will clearly make the stock uh, not resilient in order to face the shock and the impact. And so in some sense, fish and people are not very different in this case. If you, are, if you are already sick and there is uh, an epidemic or a flu hitting you, uh, then, then uh, you are likely to go down. But if you are very healthy, then you have more ability to withstand the health stress. And that's what this is all about. And the literature on this are building as, as we go. So too much catch, less biomass, weakens the resilience of the, of the fish. When you take down the marine food where you, you truncate it, you are making, it's almost like a body that doesn't have all, the, all, all its past functioning well. 
again, not proteins here. And if you don't have a home, uh, you have nothing really. You have no place to, to hide or to rest or something. And it's the same with fish. So all this together uh, make the fish uh, not in the position to withstand the shock from climate change. Now, when you have less fishing, when you have fishing below, ma below or at maximum sustainable yield, and this is something uh, the, the, the EU has a policy on, and the policy to, to end overfishing by 2020, which is a very important uh, policy, which for the sake of climate change and other, other, other losses due to overfishing, this needs to be actually uh, implemented. But the signs are not good already. I think this week or last week, the, the, there was a, uh, something coming out of the EU that indicates it's going to fail to meet its own mandate. So, but if you fish at or below MSY, then according to this paper, which was published last year by Chang et al, uh, you actually increase or, or decrease the extinction risk of the stock according to this work, by up to 60% or over. So if you have MSY fishing, you have a stronger uh, biomass in the ocean, and therefore under different climate scenarios, you are going to reduce the risk of extinction of, of species, and in some cases up to 60%, which is huge. Now, reducing fishing effort will also result in gains in catch even under climate change, what does that tell you? It tells you that the biomass is more resilient when you have, uh, when you, when you have less fishing effort, which is the same as fishing less than MSY or at worst at MSY. In that case, this study uh, led by Gaines, Steve Gaines, shows that actually you'll be able to mitigate losses and catches under climate change if you have reduced fishing effort. Another indication of the ability of the biomass to be resilient under the stress of climate change. Now, this point has not been made yet, which is the point we'll be making in our paper, is that if you have less fishing effort or if you fish below MSY, the fishing sector itself will, 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 help, will help make the system more resilient in a number of ways. First of all, you have less burning of carbon because you have less fishing effort. And if you do the reduction of fishing effort cleverly by taking out fishing gear that actually use a lot of excess fuel, then you are going to reduce the release of carbon from the fishing sector. Uh, and that can then lead to less climate change and therefore make this, the, the, the ocean and the fish they contain more resilient. Another value here is we know that fish, certain types of fish and marine living organisms actually sequester carbon. They take carbon down and kind of store it away for us. In a paper we did in published in 2014, uh, Alex Rogers and myself and two other co-authors, we actually calculate the value of the carbon that is sequestered by marine animals in the high seas. And what we found was quite amazing. In fact, we, when we calculated the economic value, we, we saw that the value to us of this carbon sequestration is at least 10 times the value of the fish if we catch them and sell them. So, so there is a lot of that going on. And that again makes the ecosystem more resilient, the fish more because you reduce carbon, carbon available to, to warm up the ocean and make it acidic and so on. So that's another, another way uh, optimal fishing, ending of fishing would be very helpful to the system and therefore to people. Now, how do you, how do you really start dealing seriously about ending of fishing? If you ask an economist, they will, will tell you to remove the incentive to overfish. It's a, a very simple way of saying a lot of things. And, and a key thing you have to do is to improve national fisheries money. And this has been said in the literature, but up to now, we haven't been quite successful in many places, including in Europe. There are estimates that, that show that stocks in Europe are uh, overfish 
by a range of about 40 to 70 percent depending on the type of species you look and how comprehensive you do the analysis you know so this is in europe that's that's a lot so improvement in national fisheries management is still very important and, and and the effectiveness of this management is what is important right so we need to work there now managing your fisheries within your waters alone will not do it because fish don't respect national borders you know fish go where they go i like to joke and say fish don't need visa right <laughs> whether there's brexit or there's no brexit the fish go where they go they don't care so you need to have regional management in some cases global management if you're thinking of the high seas so that is crucial and we have to do more of that in order to safeguard our fisheries reduce overfishing and therefore help us with climate change mitigation and also adaptation now illegal fishing is happening and there's a lot of information about this it's happening almost everywhere some places more than other parts of the ocean and it's costing us a lot. Some estimate put the, the losses to over $20 billion a year from, from illegal fishing that is lost to the formal economic sector, uh, the fishing sector. And this needs to be, to be dealt with. If you ask an economist, what we'll say is people fish illegally because it's profitable for them to do it. Either the surveillance system is too weak, so they are not caught, or even when they are caught, the penalties are so low, it doesn't matter. So you, we need to make this profitable. The third thing we can do is to buy insurance by creating marine protected areas or marine reserves. And again, there's a lot in the literature about this. I'll come back to this later. And for me as an economist, the insurance value of NPS alone, I think is valuable enough actually to support their implementation. For the same reason that you buy insurance for your house or for your health, you don't buy health insurance and sit down praying that you die the next minute so you get that. You buy it just to protect you and those you care about, even after you're gone. And that is a very useful uh, tool here for us to do that when it comes to the ocean. The, the next thing is actually the way we use government funds, uh, public money, uh, giving it as subsidies to the fishing sector for all sorts of reasons. But many of those subsidies are harmful in the sense that they lead to overcapacity and overfishing. And this is not debatable. That's why the world has agreed to do something about it and giving the WTO the mandate to discipline subsidies. Negotiations are ongoing. Europe can really help here by setting a good example and ensuring that EU harmful subsidies are either redirected or taken out or used for something. You can help the coastal communities in ways that don't destroy the resources they, they rely on. And, and, and the science in Europe are not looking good. Uh, in fact, there is a move to bring back subsidies that were taken away in 2004 because to build boats or buy engines because they are harmful. And now there's an effort to bring to bring this out. Uh, I and my colleagues thought this is so 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 crazy to do. Actually, after all that we know at this time, when the WTO is working hard to negotiate a deal, we have an important political entity like the EU trying to reintroduce subsidies that are clearly harmful. So, please don't introduce them. Set a good example for the world, and and then we'll, we'll try to deal with this. And I love the fishing communities. I want more resources to go in there, but not to go and kill the, the, the fish that supports them and should support their children and grandchildren into the future. The last point I'm, I'm going to put up here is that for us to really end overfishing, we have to think global because we have a global ocean. I've touched a bit on that. And I'll come back and give a little example on subsidies and and thinking global or at life scale or regional uh, before I end this. Now, this is a kind of organizing uh, idea and principle that I've been developing recently. Essentially, I really think that to end overfishing, we need to structure our policies and the action.
actions we take, such that they do not lead to negative feedback from people to nature and nature to people. And at the moment, many of our policies seem to be, to be reinforcing negative feedback and therefore making things worse for people and nature as time goes on. A good example is subsidies, and I'll, I'll have one slide that I will elaborate on that. Another policy is marine protection, and here too we can do better in many instances. Um, and, and I explain. You want a situation where you put policies and you take actions that lead to positive feedback from people to nature and nature to people or the ocean. And the example of subsidies is a telling one. So let's get to that to kind of explain what I'm saying. So here is a picture that summarizes um, a paper we published last year on subsidies, me and my PhD student, Anna Shobawa. What we did here to, was to say, the world gives X amount of subsidies and the estimate then was $35 billion a year to the fishing sector. And the question we ask is, how much of these 35 billion goes to small scale fishes versus large scale fishes? And I was motivated to do this work because I keep hearing from politicians that they give subsidies to help small scale, poor, vulnerable people. And this, I've never really believed this, and but I didn't have the data and we got to analyze the data here. What you see here is uh, globally, 84% of the estimated $35 billion goes to large scale industrial fleet. Only 16% goes to the small scale. So if anyone tells you we are giving subsidies to help with small scale, tell them no, please, you know. And that's what we see here is huge. Now, the next thing we ask is how much of the money that goes to the large scale and small scale and they are classified as capacity enhancing, therefore, bad subsidies. That's the two in red color for the two large scale and small scale. And here again, you see, was about 40% of the total, 16% of the global that goes to the small scale is considered harmful. 60% of the large scale subsidies are considered harmful. And you can easily understand it, the most harmful subsidy that we know about is fewer subsidies because it directly reduces operating costs and makes people go fish when, when the market wouldn't support. And think about having a big bottom trawler that consumes fuel like crazy and you have a lot of fuel subsidies so most of it then will go to the trawler. There's so somebody with a hook and line catching fish on their little boat with no engine or small engine. So that's what you're seeing. And this picture is quite powerful in a number of ways. It shows that subsidies encourage overfishing because a lot of it is capacity enhancing. It also shows that the way we give subsidies now undermines the sustainable development goals in many ways. Yeah, first of all, it, it takes down the fish. So food security is a problem. That's one thing the SDGs want to eliminate. It goes to large scale, disadvantages small scale, which is not a good thing again because we want to reduce poverty. And most of it goes to actual fishing where most of the fishes are men, not processing where majority of the, of the processes are women globally. So we are disadvantaging women versus men, which I don't think is the way to use public funds given the way uh, the world is already so, so so against women in terms of equality. So that's one thing. And in fact, many women are in the small scale also. So that's another, another disadvantage. And how about our future people, young people, this thing just take down the resource. It doesn't help the future generation. So anyhow you look at this, the current way of we give subsidies is negative for fish, negative for the people. I think most people in the world today would like to support and help. And, and so, this is the way to reinforce negative feedback from people to nature because the coast is where most people are who need the food, the seafood, and they don't get it because we give public funds to support the last fish. And that makes the poorer parts of the population hang on the last fish and therefore take the ecosystem down. So we don't want to do this, we want to reverse that. 
the, 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 the last main point is about thinking globally. This is because the ocean is actually one ocean. We're all interconnected. You have the light blue, blue areas are the, the country waters, exclusive economic zones, 200 nautical miles away from your coast. And the dark blue areas are the so-called high seas, which is about two thirds of the, of the whole ocean. And, and what I say is this light and blue, the fish actually don't know, they don't care about that. They go in and out. And so what you do in one part of the ocean, whether it's high sea, EEZ, country waters, or even it's a regional thing, whether it's French waters or British waters, whether it is whatever, the distance they mingle. And so what you do in one part can affect that. And we need to think about this as we try to reduce fishing, protect the ocean, and help climate change through, through that. So in conclusion, some of the things we can we, we draw from our work so far is that ending of fishing now will strengthen the ocean, making it more capable of withstanding climate change impacts. And I think few will argue about this and more papers are coming and, and, and showing this. And doing so will contribute to mitigating and even adapting to climate change. And as I mentioned before, a healthy person is more likely to survive an epidemic than a person who is less healthy. The same thing applies to fish. And because of our overfishing, we have severely weakened the ability, the immune system of the, of, the, of the ocean and its ability to take in more shocks and more stresses. In this way, people and the ocean are not that different. Isn't that cool? Remember, people in the ocean are not that different. A healthy person, a healthy ocean is more capable of withstanding stresses and shops. Thank you very much for your attention and thanks to our ocean for making this webinar and this work possible. Now I pass it over to Rebecca and we'll see what happens. Okay. <laughs> thanks yes. Feshi, thank you so much. So we have uh, just a couple of questions in the in the chat. If anyone uh, has any questions about well, if anyone is struggling to ask a question, uh, there is a small tab on the side uh, or on the control panel called questions. And if you type your question in there and submit it, then we can, can read it and, and respond. Um, so thanks Rashid for that very interesting presentation and for really clearly stepping out those, those different pressures and how they're connected and how obviously ending overfishing can build resilience and therefore be a, a, a very decisive climate action, in fact. Mm. Um, we had a question from uh, Monica Verbeek about um, carbon sequestration. Mm. Is uh, the fact that fish can um, help cycle the carbon only for waters without oxygen or is it for for all areas of healthy seas. Mm. Yeah, okay. No, no, okay, that question, that's a good one. Uh, as far as I understand it at the moment, actually it's all areas, because when we did that study on the high seas, it wasn't in a specific area, whether oxygen or no oxygen, it was the whole system. And my colleague, Alex Rogers, he did the science and I did the economics and we brought them together. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yes. Okay, and um, and are there any recent estimates of how much CO two is emitted by fishing vessels globally? And the EU, um, Monica says she only has estimates from the nineties. From the nineties, yeah, I think it came out of our shop, or is it the two thousands actually? Uh, Peter Tide Myers, he did his PhD with us at UBC. He's now a professor at Dalhousie, and his estimate uh, was that about 1% of global CO2 emission comes from the fishing sector, just the marine sector. So that was the estimate then. And, and I think they are working on, on a revised version estimate now. So you can, get, you can go away with 1% at least of contribution. That is why if you reduce overfishing because of less fishing activity, and especially if you do this cleverly, 
where you take out the those uh, vessels that take in too much too much to catch one ton of fish like bottom trawlers then you'll be able to reduce this significantly without actually reducing the catch or probably even improving the quality of the catch. And um, we have a question from Nicholas Blanc is, can we expect that harmful subsidy subsidies can actually go up due to lowering abundance of key commercial species caused by climate change? Mm. You know, from, from what we've seen happen uh, through time, whenever, whenever there is a decrease in the biomass and fishers have to work hard by going far and deeper, they usually come back to the political masters and argue for more subsidies. And we've seen this again and again. So my answer to you is if climate change takes down the fish stock, given the political clout of, of the fishing sector in many countries, the chances are that this will go up. And that is completely opposite what needs to be done because you need to pull back in order to, 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 to reduce the impact of climate change. So if we give more subsidies, the, the increased fishing and you have climate change, that's a double one and that's what we don't want. Uh, the last time there was a huge increase in, in fuel prices, I, I remember seeing on TV, and this is in Brussels here, actually. Fish, fishing associations and fishers were demonstrating for, for help. And, and one of the arguments they put forward is, you know what? We actually need this government help. We need the subsidies because we have to go further. We have to go deeper to cut the same fish. So we need more money. And I was sitting there just shaking my head. I said, how did you get here in the first place? This new money will only make it necessary for you to go even further and even deeper until there's no place to go. And actually we're already hitting that limit because there's a limit even to the ocean. Huh? Very soon there will be no place to go further. To. So I'm just trying to keep up with all of the questions, everybody. It's a very small screen to read from, unfortunately. <laughs> Can't make it bigger. Um, there is uh, a, a good, um, from Jessica, so she says thanks for your talk. And is this the first major paper to make the link between climate and overfishing? And when are you expecting to publish in full? Mm. And do you know which paper? Yeah, fantastic question. Like, like I said, there are a number of papers uh, that are coming, and uh, especially last year, there were two, there were, let's see, there were three papers last year. One of them was, was, I was on that with Callum Roberts as the lead, where we actually look at how marine protected areas could help reduce overfishing and therefore also help with climate change adaptation and mitigation. Then, then William Chang looked at the risk of extinction, given different scenarios of climate change. And, and Steve Gaines, uh, Santa Barbara, they look at what better management of fisheries can do in the face of climate change. And they saw that that can mitigate the losses in catches. So the few papers are coming. Our paper is going to add to this. And actually what we, we're aiming to do is to bring all these findings in one paper and also extend that with new angles and new insights and new directions. So the literature is building. This is, this is just the beginning. And our goal is to get this if we had our way, but the review process is quite unpredictable, right? It depends on who is reviewing and the time. And, and so, but we would have loved to get this published before the climate uh, meeting, right? Is it September 25th? Yeah. So that's the, the goal, but I know the review process is so unpredictable. So as soon as possible, this month or early October, I think we should get it. Excellent. And uh, I mean, we still have a, a, a few more questions and some time. So I'm just reading them in order. So apologies if these just <laughs> are varying questions yeah, from different angles. Um, but Callum Nolan, Nolan asks, are you aware of any papers or have you thought about the link between overfishing and the reduced adaptive capacity of fishing communities, mm. particularly small scale communities in Africa, Asia, mm. etc., mm. as another means of connection between overfishing and climate change, i.e., overfishing exacerbates positive 
uh, poverty in small scale communities reduces ability to access sufficient food, education, mm. etc. And then again, creates a reduced ability for them to adapt to climate change. Abs so it's absolutely, yeah, yeah. Mm. No, that, that's, a, that's a good point and we see that happening. Uh, what I can say is there are papers that have touched on this. Uh, it's almost like what we are doing here. So papers sometimes just mention something in passing, right? But never really a focus paper that lifts the argument to, to a level that gets the attention of uh, many people. I think that has not been done yet. But a number of our papers and our colleagues around the world have touched on how climate change and really reduce uh, economic well-being, social well-being, and therefore the adaptive capacity of countries. We did a paper about West African fisheries, and it was quite scary, actually. For Nigeria, for example, we estimated that climate change can reduce the catch by 50%. And if you know the coast of Nigeria, this will scare the hell out of you. Most people, that's the only animal protein they get to eat. And if this is going down by 50% while population is going up, mm. just trouble, I tell you, it's just trouble. So if touch on something that needs to be written in a paper that actually leaves the issue and makes us more alive. Excellent, yeah, I think um, it's definitely something for the, the next level of the paper for yeah. sure. What did, um, Andrea um, Ripple has said, can we therefore say that overfishing is the biggest threat to the to ocean biodiversity and resilience to climate change? Mm. At the moment, I mean, I, I think many of us believe overfishing is the big one because it is the one thing that directly kills the fish, directly targets the fish. Climate change could possibly take over in the near future. Uh, because of the massive level of climate change, but otherwise it is an indirect route to fish. You get too warm and you either, you either move or you perish because your temperature range is exceeded, it gets more acidic. But uh, yeah, at the moment I would say overfishing is the thing. And then all the other things come on top of that and make the situation really bad. And in... Uh... The, there's a lot of thank yous for the presentation, yeah, of you, course. Thank you to all of um, you. There's a couple of more questions about the carbon sequestration, and this is mm. definitely an issue that we discussed at length mm. uh, when when developing this the approach to this paper, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, so someone said, in the work on carbon sequestration from fish stocks, did you calculate the increased contribution of recovered fish stocks global carbon sinks? Mm. I, no, I wouldn't say so, no. The what we did was uh, to look at uh, high seas, the, the fish in there and what they do, but we haven't done specifically what, what you said here. We have done analysis of the economic benefits of rebuilding, but mainly seeing it through food, through the catch. So what you have just asked could be quite an interesting uh, follow-up study. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So the value of rebuild stocks to carbon sequestration and the carbon uh, action. And that one. Yeah. Yeah. So you guys are really building up a number of papers here. That's nice. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> this is going to be a very big paper. Yeah, yeah, I really know. Worked. Oh, a number of them. Right? Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so um, Another question that I think is really interesting from Alex Bartoli. So we're hearing from some governments that they want to use subsidies to help vessels engines change with the excuse that these new engines will be more efficient in terms of less fuel consumption, mm. which should be good to fight climate change. But this also has the risk that fishermen will spend more time at sea with the same fuel expenses, which in reality means that it increases the fishing capacity. Mm. So, what do you think about using subsidies for that purpose? Could this be good or based in your experience? Is it just another trick in the industry? Yeah, you know, given, given the history of our management and how good or how not good we have been, I'm as skeptical as you asking the question, really, because 
if the man management is not effective and you do this, ultimately what ends up being happening is that you end up with more effective fishing effort on the water and that leads to overfishing. So, so I'm with you with that really. And so if they really want to spend that money in the communities, there are ways to decouple it completely from, from fishing for, from fishing capacity. Already we have just too much fishing capacity. There are, there are estimates that we have uh, more than, I mean, we can catch optimally MSY globally with only one third of the current fishing effort we have. So why do you want to make fishing engines more efficient? I don't, I don't really see why. Um, I think the issue of subsidies as a driving factor is quite oh interesting. God, it's huge. Um, mm. So there's a couple of questions about yellowfin tuna. I mean, we are trying to keep the conversation more broad than that, but this is perhaps a good example. Um, the question is, Emmanuel, over recent years, we've seen a decline in yellowfin tuna, which do you think is the most triggering factor between fishing and overfishing? What's, well, there's a specific question about what is the level of subsidies in the Indian Ocean, which you may or may not have to hand immediately. Mm, mm. Yeah, you see yellowfin, yellowfin a few years ago, everybody said, oh, that stock is at least okay, right? Uh, we'd say bluefin is down, even bigger is a bit, but yellowfin is okay. And at the time when we were saying this, I was already worried because it's almost the same fishing down marine food web thing. If you've taken all the bluefin and you've taken a lot of the big eye, what do you think will happen? They go to the next valuable fish, and that will be yellowfin. And so it goes. So the same procedure is happening again with uh, yellowfin. And in terms of subsidies, uh, there was a paper we did looking at the actually Indian Ocean. We were looking at it with, with tuna on subsidies, and and we found that a big chunk of the of the revenues of the, of the tuna fleece is actually subsidies. So it's clearly a driver of the of the overfishing usage. This is part of, part of the, the overfishing usage as well. Um, and we have a low battery in the house. <laughs> yeah, well. um, so there is one other question, and I have a question. Yeah. Um, so from someone earlier. Uh, how can we better demonstrate functional or ecological dependencies of coastal and high seas fisheries ah. in order to strengthen the support for better regulation at national levels? Fantastic. You know, this question, yeah, the high seas and the, the we, we're looking to, we're looking for more power, huh? So if you feel like I'm not as that's the reason we have to keep the machines going, okay. Yeah, so the connection between high seas and coastal waters is, is, a, is a tough one for many people to perceive, right? Uh, I remember giving a, a talk to fishers and stakeholders in Cape Town and the small scale fishers and why, why should we care? That's so far away, we don't. And I kind of tried to convince them and what I did, what we did then was look at the total catch that we take globally. And we asked very simple questions. We say, what percentage of this catch comes from fish that spend all their time only in country waters in EEZ? How much of it comes from fish that live all their lives in the high seas? And how much goes are fish that go in and out? And this is unbelievable. There's very little fish that live all their lives in the high seas. They're very special fish, they're deep water, they're by sea mounts, and it's less than 1% of our total catch, far less than 1%. Now, about 78%, if I remember well, of the value of the catch we take globally are fish that go in and out of the high seas. The remainder are fish that live solely in EEZs. So you see, there's a big interaction between the two, uh, just looking at the, at the catch data. And, and recent modeling by Steve, uh, what is his name? Chris Costello and his group in Santa Barbara show a lot of interaction also between the two. So tuners just go all over. There's one tuna 
by the time they finish their life, they go through the waters of 43 different countries and the high sea. So that's the kind of interaction we see for highly migratory species. There is a connection. We just have to make this clear and let people understand. In fact, after that talk with the, with the local fishermen in Cape Town, you can't believe it. They got the message so well, they just whisked me away to the coast and gave me some fresh lunch there. I mean, it was unbelievable how they saw the connection and decided to push their minister actually to do something. Yeah. Mm. And uh, a question from Gonzalo. So thank you again for the presentation. And how have fishermen and their representatives reacted to this work so far? Or how do you predict that they will? Yeah, so in general, well, what we see is that um, one fisherman, like the association, when they, they talk, the, the tendency is always to, to say, oh, you ivory tower people, you don't know what you're doing. But when you talk one-to-one, -one, they, they really come down and tell you, look, we, we know that are issues. We know that we spend more time on the water to catch the fish, you know, than before, and so on and so forth. So they do understand. I think the biggest obstacle is the issue of short-term, long-term. And you can understand some of the, 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 the stance they take, because if you have a mortgage on your boat and you have to pay and you just have to hang in there and keep doing what you're doing just to keep alive. In many instances, that is what is driving this. So I say that we need to think as society, we need to find ways to kind of ease the pressure on such communities so that they can look further into the future uh, into the future a bit more and that will then help us to move to a better place where they can do better but uh, to solve that problem society has a thing we have to try to help the fishermen now so that they can allow the the, the system to grow and be better mm. so i had a question kind of for the end we we i think we have pretty much answered most of the questions in the in the in the chat um and of course identified a few areas for new research um but uh in terms of achievability uh you know if if we're looking at okay the impact of overfishing on fish in the ocean, on the health of the ocean and on its ability to mitigate against what is climate. very, very rapid and increasingly rapid you know, climate change impacts. How, how uh, achievable is this and, and, and how much effort do you think we should give this in light of all the things that, of course, we need to do to mm -hmm. in, improve our, our ability and our resilience to deal with climate change, um, you know, how, how, yeah, exactly, how, how achievable and, and how practical mm. it is, mm. is ending overfishing as, a, as an activity and a, and, a, and a tool in the toolbox that we need to. Mm. Yeah, so, so you reserved the, the, the most difficult question for yourself, that's great. Yeah, you know, uh, the fishing sector is difficult for all sorts of reasons. In some places, people just depend on this for their livelihood. So yeah. it's tough to really get people to pull back, even though pulling back is what will help mm. these people. So, so you have, the again, the short-term, long-term thing. What I always say is that we never give up. We always try to do our best. There's a lot of competition for attention on climate change, but the beauty of and the overfishing is that you're going to end up with a lot of co-benefits. Mm -hmm. That's actually cumulatively, the benefits will be high relative to other sectors, I guess. But I think fish, if we save the fish, we're saving the marine environment, which is important. The ocean gives us a lot of oxygen, for example, it moderates the temperature. So whatever we can invest in the ocean will have so many uh, co-benefits that will make it worthwhile. And therefore, no matter the competition for resources, I think it is really crucial for us to find a way to ensure that we reduce overfishing in order to get all these core benefits. And, uh, yeah. 
but it's not easy. And 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 because uh, ending overfishing can also help with climate mitigation. Maybe the ocean sector, the fishing sector, should really push hard to feature in the climate debate even more. Because as far as I can tell, there are more resources going to climate change efforts than the ocean, which is weird because really the ocean mitigates a lot of the climate thing. So we have to find a way to, to capitalize the value of the ocean in the fight against climate. Yeah. One last question came in, which I think we have the, the time to take. Yeah. And just so that people know, uh, we have recorded this webinar and we will make it available. Um, probably at the same location, but also if you registered, then you'll get sent a link to the, to the recording as well. And we'll also make it available on the Owlfish website as well, which is owlfish.eu. So there's just one last question in terms of uh, where certain stocks have become, oh, uh, sorry, just lost the question. Where certain stocks have become collapsed or near collapsed, what are the top three positive steps that need to be taken in order to recover the stocks? And do you have good examples from outside of the EU where stocks have been recovered from collapse successfully and how mm. governments intervened in a positive way, as you were talking about, to manage the human side of the equation in terms yeah. of, you know, did they invest in diversification or reskilling to help address those short-term impacts? Mm. Mm. Yeah, so thinking of how to recover our fish stocks, right? You, you talked about outside of the EU, but actually Europe is, uh, has one good example, is actually outside the the EU, that is the Norwegian spring spawning area, which nearly collapsed. They nearly lost this completely, but they were quick to put in a moratorium and they enforced it and the fish came back and it's still doing well. So that is one example, not too far away from the European Union. Uh, and then if you look at the US, I think the US has also made quite a, a big effort in rebuilding stocks. Uh, they have the Stephen Magnuson Act, which is quite mm -hmm. rigid. I mean, if the fish stock is declared overfished, you are mandated to really stop all fishing and try to recover it within 10 years if the fish stock naturally can do it. So mm -hmm. that is, and, and we've seen some recoveries in the US because of this. So that's serious effort at the federal level to, to push this through. So you can find examples around why people have done this and, and, and it has improved the situation. But for every example, there are tons of bad examples. I mean, uh, I don't like giving Canada a rap, but the cut stocks are of Newfoundland, they haven't come back yet. And, and there are also some reasons for this, whether it's climate or gym change. And in some cases, actually, fishing has never really completely stopped, you know, so. So there are all sorts of reasons the things you don't need to do. In terms of three things that can help, check out all the harmful subsidies as difficult as it may be. Because even without subsidies, if you allow the market to dictate what fish you are, we still have the work, uh, work cut out because it's a common resource and there's competition for the fish. They are going to raise for the fish anyway without management. So check out the subsidies. And as much as possible, buy insurance put part of your ocean portfolio in a protected area, just like you would do with your savings account or your, 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 your pension account. Don't touch it, keep it there for when it will be needed. The ocean, our children and grandchildren will need the ocean. So let's protect part of it. So if we mess up where we fish, at least we have uh, replenishment coming from, from the protected part. Uh, so I've given you two now. Another thing that we have found through our work uh, using game theory is that you really need collaboration to, to, to deal with common property resources. I mean, one because you are sharing most of the fish, one country alone cannot do it. You have to work together ultimately. And this is why this resource is collaboration and cooperation is central to success. I know it's difficult, but that is what all the theory says and the practice also. And actually, it's not impossible. One example I like to give is uh, the management of the Barents Sea Court by 
even the Soviet Union and Norway throughout the Cold War, they discovered that the fish is so important for their people. They tried to forget all the big political stuff and on the ground, Soviet Union scientists, Norwegian scientists work together, assess the fish, do the allocation and, and, and manage for the interests of the fish and their people. And that is still going on under Russia now. And that's, uh, I think, a good example of how people should operate. In South China Sea, there are issues there and I, I've been telling them that politics is something you may not be able to deal with, but the fish is crucial for billions of people in this area. So China and the other countries think again, work to ensure the sustainability of the fish, and, and you can do your whatever politics, but what is important for the people should be taken care of. Thanks, Rashid. You're very welcome. That makes it one hour, and in an effort to not um, push over into people's a lot of times, uh, we will call it a close here. Um, as I said, uh, Rashid's paper and the presentation that he just gave is available in the handout section of this webinar, and we'll put them on the Our Fish website as well. And we'll also make sure that there's a recording available so you'll get sent a link to that and put it on the website. And this is really just, I think, the beginning of this conversation. So we look forward to if anyone has any other feedback or mm. would like to be more involved. This is something that we'll be talking with uh, EU members of parliament and member state governments and other scientists and stakeholders over the coming months. So please do get in touch uh, if you'd like to, to be involved in that. Yeah, thank you very much. And bye-bye for taking time with us. We appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much.